this talk came out of a talk which I've done several times now. Uh, started off doing it for groups <laughs> of, um, shall we say, civilians, people who have not actually involved themselves with Shakespeare before. And then <clears throat> I thought, we've done lots of plays here of Shakespeare, and we've analysed them and sort of chewed them over, but we haven't sort of tackled, if you like, the man just in himself, or, or done a coverall one of why he is worth studying, why he's worth your attention, and why it's worth going to his plays, and also, I suppose, to talk about his genius. Um, and I can use that word because he is, of all people, one of the universally recognised geniuses of, uh, of humanity. Um, now, the other thing which you may need to know as a background to this, this discussion group is based on the work of a chap called Eugene Halliday, who uh, died in 1987. And uh, who had worked with one or two people who come here, including myself and me. And his idea was that there is actually a perennial philosophy. There's a philosophy in all religions and in most philosophies, and is a background of a great deal of intellectual life. And that Shakespeare is one of those magnificent expound exponents of this. So that's the framework that I'll be coming from. You don't have to agree with me on that side, no, that score, but. Um, you saved that chair for you, Derek. Thank you. As ever. Okay. Uh, but that's the, the sort of uh, that's the the the, um, the angle I'm coming at this from. And Eugene used to recommend Shakespeare um, on a regular basis, and he used to quote from him constantly. Uh, so it was. I grew up in a house where my father was uh, very very keen on Shakespeare anyway, so this sort of keyed in with what I was doing, and. Um, I've always found that the plays are wonderful. Uh, it wasn't until I got a little bit longer in the tooth that I was able to, to analyse this stuff and to see some of the reasoning behind why people are amazed at the amount of work that's come out. So I'm going to start with just generally bigging them up, as they say in, in modern parlance, trying to bring home to you what we have in Shakespeare in terms of uh, English literature, what we have by his form. He, uh, he was writing 400 years ago. So for most of us here, that creates a problem. Um, he uses a language which is called modern English, which is at the very cusp of its formulation. So for most of us, it isn't very familiar. Which is weird, because he's considered to have added about 10,000 words to the language. He's coined them. They weren't there in literature before. He may have, they may have been in common parlance, but he was the one who first wrote them down. And that's <coughs> a hell of a lot of words to coin. So he's actually at the cutting edge of the creation of our language. You have to remember that before him, very few people had, had troubled to write poetry, plays, literature in English. Latin was the formal language of the, of the country, and all legal things were written in, in Latin, forms of Latin, not the Latin that the Romans spoke, but uh, dogged versions of that and legal versions of that. So the language is actually changing. The mercantile sort of people and the, um, the aristocrats often spoke purely in French. Um, so it was, English was the common language, which was only just becoming to be taken seriously. Um, Chaucer was the first one to really write in English and to, to make any impact on, on the nation. And Shakespeare is, along with his, his cohorts, and there, there were many people in the same century who were starting to, to push into the language. So you can see that when he was writing, he's starting to form not just the language, in that sense, but ways of thinking about ourselves and the nation taking itself seriously. And We'd have to say as well that the Renaissance came late to England. It started literally in Italy and um, spread across Europe slowly. 
It is, I am reliably informed from only watching last night about the impact of the Islamic civilization on the West, that um, it was kicked off by the Islamic uh, scholars bringing the classical literature into Spain, and that this literally percolated across Europe, basically went to Italy, and then from Italy across the rest of Europe. This, um, if anybody saw the uh, Islamic mm -hmm. thing on Europe last night on the, on the box, it was fascinating to watch. That's absolutely fascinating. I've never heard it so clearly stated. Um, what they were saying is that even our, our number system was unwieldy. The fact that we still used Roman numerals in the 16th century, you know, it was, didn't work. So the architects immediately took on the Islamic forms of, of numbers. They're the ones that we use nowadays are Islamic. And uh, they formulated them because you couldn't calculate very well in that. Uh, you can't multiply in Roman numerals, as you can imagine. It becomes totally unwieldy very quickly. Architects immediately moved into this, and they found mason's marks and carpenter's marks in the cathedrals of, of England, built sort of in the 15th and the 16th century, which are using these Islamic numbering systems, so that very rapidly it was taken on by, uh, if you like, the professionals that needed it. So this kickoff of classical information, which has been stored mostly in Alexandria um, after the fall of, of the Roman Empire, was flooding back because the um, Islamic scholars brought it in essentially into Spain. It was percolating through into Europe again. And again, particularly in Italy, people began to study the classics. They became more accessible again. So the Greek philosophers and the Roman philosophers were suddenly being looked at again in the 15th century in Italy and in the 16th century by the time it got to England. It was slow coming here. We were an outcrop of, of, of European civilization. We were considered to be rather blunt and a bit sort of um, peasantish by the Italians and the French. Not only did they think that we were a backwater, but most of our aristocracy were still farmers. You know, and that was very sort of infradict because their aristocracy lived on the money, money that came from land, but they never actually went back to their lands. And stuff. They were living on rents, if you like, and capital. Whereas our guys, like Sir Walter Raleigh, still had to go home, you know, when it was lambing season. So, <laughs> so they were, we had the strange sort of causes. We were just starting to get to this level of sophistication. So if you can take that as a sort of um, history of the, uh, placing it in time, you can see that someone like Shakespeare, a wordsmith, <coughs> comes along, he is literally fabricating the language which he's using in his plays. We think, one of the things which is going to constantly come up in this talk, and I do apologise to you, but it is the nature of it, Shakespeare is really quite unique in that he doesn't comment on his own stuff. We have no, we have no opinions of his other than the plays and the poems. We, have, we know certain legal things he was involved in, we know that he had certain charters, he was involved with his, with his um, players, and um, we know that several of his plays were commissioned, and we know several cases when he took things to court. And we've even got bills of lading and things that he bought like wine and wool. But we haven't got any of his letters, none of his essays, and nothing that he wrote other than the plays and the poems. So he didn't seem to comment on them. It's not really known whether he published any of his stuff, which sounds ridiculous. Sounds ridiculous. Many people treasured his work and stored it and kept it, and people stole it and pinched it and did all things like that. He never seemed to bother. He sold it, he made a lot of money. Um, he retired, if you like. The last few years of his life, we don't know what he did for sure. He may have written a few plays in conjunction with another person, but he was a landed gentry. He had the second biggest house in Stratford. He did very well out of his plays. He didn't seem to need to write because he stopped and went back there and lived as a landed gentry. Travelling to London, we know because of the court cases he was involved in. But he didn't seem to need to follow up or to push or to um, expound his stuff at all. Which is very strange because scholars say his <coughs> plays are so well written, so deeply written, that you can't get enough out of them in one viewing of a play, or in viewing the plays, you have to read them closely. 
In other words, you have to unpick them. And one of the things I've been involved in this latter part of my life is teaching English closely read, which means you get Shakespeare or something and you pick it apart. And we'll do a little bit of that tonight so we can show you the extent of, if you like, his um, genius as a wordsmith, the way he plays with things. Um, we're not going to refer much to the plays, but we're going to refer to them a little bit because, of course, they are a tremendous sort of um, oeuvre, if you like, a tremendous work of a man's life. The other thing it's worth saying is he wrote 38 plays from about 1590 to 1602. Sorry, sorry, 1610. Now, if you do the calculation on that, it's, it's just about two plays a year, which is really pretty good going. And uh, when you consider that most of them are still being performed now, 400 years after you wrote them. And in your, so if you also realise that nobody knows what all the words mean in Shakespeare's plays. I've worked with many scholars, international scholars, and they all admit there are words in the plays that nobody knows what they mean. We can have a guess at it, but we don't know the words have gone. A lot of them are slang. Some of them are being formed by Shakespeare, so he may have invented that word. Again, we don't know. But no one knows all the words. So if you do struggle when you see anything in Shakespeare, that's fine. We have educated guessers, and they can get an awful lot of money for <coughs> guessing in an educated way. But nobody knows. And your opinion is extremely valuable. But Shakespeare was writing for us. He was writing for people like us. Let me just prove that to you, because he was involved with an incredible machine that had only just really been invented at the time, very slowly over a period of hundreds of years. It was called the theatre. And I want to sort of describe that to you You've got a stage, also got a balcony here, sorry. You've got the stage there. It's called a thrust stage because it juts out. You've got two big pillars in there. You've got an auditorium here. And you've got rows of seats there. And you've got another balcony, rows of seats on there. I think there's two rows on each. If I remember correctly, and then you've got the roof of the place here. This part here, the, the, the globe is was actually an octagon, roughly. So it's almost like a circle of roofed area. This roofed area here is thatched on both sides. So if you're up here, you're sheltered. Down here, you've got what are called the groundlings here. This is like a football crowd, as they used to be before they sat down. And this thing was a machine which they developed, particularly in England, for showing plays. It's magical because it has so many things to it. It's supposed to be a hexagon because you've got the seven planets being reflected. This is one side and you've got seven, if you like, faces. I, if I draw it here. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if that's the stage here, the actors are actually facing seven-sided. And they used to use the planets, or the gods if you like, to refer to, to help them to remember as orators what they were saying, is one of the things that is, that is often used about it. Because they would later on they put devices on them to help as memory stimuluses of that. Beyond that, you can say it's open to the elements, it uses natural light, so they didn't, they couldn't do performances much after dusk because people couldn't see what was going on. It was afternoon theatre, and part of the problem with Shakespeare and the other playwrights' success was that workers would sky away from work and go to watch the plays. And one of the reasons that they used to close the playhouses, which they did regularly, 
They used to close the plague houses regularly when there, there was disease in the city. Because a lot of people congregated there. As many as 3,000 would be in the environs of the globe. Not all of them would be inside watching the play, but the doors were sort of semi-open. You could come in and go out. These people here would come in and go out. These people would leave and get a drink and come back. The floor here of the theatre was hazelnut shells because there were no toilets. And you've all heard about Gerard Depardieu. Well, I'm sure that sort of thing was going on here as well. And outside. So this is, as we say, were, these were farming types, and the whole thing was designed to work, to function at that level. There would be people here selling pies and fruit, etc., and food. Beer was on, was on offer as well. If ever you want, has anyone here been to the, to the New Globe in London? Great. Marvellous. Marvellous. What you see, like yeah. <laughs> you have to see it as a machine. It's fantastic. You've got more than a thousand people within, I would say, 30 meters of the stage. So you're sitting at, from the stage here, you're fixing just a whole mass of people who are very close. So they can all see, there's no scenery that we would know it. There's the pillars, which are decorated, and there will be props. There would be things, for instance, um, uh, swords would be brought on tables and chairs and things to help them out. But there would be no scenery that we know, nothing painted like that. There would be costumes. But most of the costumes would be the dress of the 17th century, of uh, 16, Jean de Cusper II, so it's, it's of that particular period, with perhaps a Roman helmet or a breastplate or something like that. Soldiers would be, even Roman soldiers would be dressed like soldiers of the day. So when you see plays nowadays, when they do Shakespeare in modern dress, that's completely, completely in keeping. He would be doing his Roman plays in Elizabethan dress with perhaps the old Roman helmet and the perhaps a sword. So that was all part of the form. But if you look, you'll see also, when I say that, that Shakespeare is writing for everybody, you have here, these people here would pay something like a penny to get into the, the auditorium. They would be, excuse me, standing. Now, I don't know where, where you actually sat, Gary, <coughs> I think actually we, we had seats, but we went and joined the ground links because it was more fun. It's magic now. <laughs> yeah. Because when the actors speak, and often they come here, you can immediately, like they used to, the, the crowd surges to them to listen. The whole thing becomes very vibrant and they move to listen to what's going on. We went to, um, we saw Anthony and Cleopatra, which was a which was very, very powerful play. During the course of the afternoon, it started to rain which is great, because you've got thatch grooves here, which are, you know, really do work well for about an hour. The thatch soaks up the water, <laughs> and then they become like glass, and then it skids off the roof, and it just hits you. It aims for the back of your neck. It's incredible. So you're, sta you're standing here, getting drenched. The actors are quite dry, and the, the aristocrats and the, the, um, the merchants are very dry, but you're getting drenched, you know. It is a very lively experience, and as I say, you're extremely close. If you think that what the population of London, I looked it up today, is was about considered to be around about two hundred thousand at the time that Shakespeare was putting his plays on, uh, it's worth mentioning that they think thirty to forty thousand people died in the plague, which is a heck of a lot of the population to use in, to lose in one choke. The Theatres were closed at one point for a whole year because of the, in, of the infection rate. In fact, the whole nature of the Globe, Shakespeare didn't start at the, at the Globe, this was a, a theatre which he invested in and helped to build on the south side of the Thames. The only reason why they were on the south side of the Thames is you were beyond the city. While you were in the city, and there were, there were Puritans in control of the city, the theatres were closed regularly. Um, not just play, but uh, every now and again they would something um, rude would happen on stage, so they'd close the theatres again and they were saying that they were very bad for the populace and they, because they enjoyed themselves. And the Puritans didn't like that, as we know. When they closed the theatres, of course, it meant that there was no money at all coming in, and this was quite a money spender. You can imagine pennies down here, about 800 people down here. You've got hundreds of people here paying tuppence. And the really posh people who had a cushion as well, they paid tenants. That used to generate a heck 
make up a lot of money. They actually try and work out how much money these plays would generate. So much money that they'd often put a different play on every day. Rather like, not, not sort of continuously, but they, they do them in tandem, like they do with opera. You know, we look at the, opera, the same opera each night, because the singers can't, can't sing every night. They would do them in, we would class it as in repertory. They'd change them around to keep the, the place buzzing over. So it was making a fortune. And when it was closed, a lot of fortunes were lost. So they moved outside of London, across the river, to the south side, south of, where they built the theatre. We even know there was contention with Shakespeare because the site that the original theatre was on, the man that owned it decided he wanted to tear it down and build high-rise flats, as you would. You could get a lot more money from that than the rent he was getting from the theatre. So Shakespeare and his boys took him to court and proved that he didn't own the theatre, he only owned the land. So they took the theatre apart, using carpenters, God bless them, carried it across the river and put it together on the other side of the river, adding different bits and making it a more efficient theatre. So, we have a character who is a playwright, a poet. His poems are recognised as being some of the greatest in the language. He was involved in this as a, an enterprise. We know that he performed not just in his plays, but in other people's plays as well, from cast lists. We know that he played um, Hamlet's ghost in his own production of Hamlet. So w he was somebody who was on the board. We also know, and this will become a shock to purists, that he changed his plays a lot. There are several versions of Macbeth, there are several versions of different plays. The reason for that is because in, when they were touring around, some of the plays would be shortened. He would change things that didn't work. He's on stage. It, these things are, are not sacrosanct to playwrights. They're constantly hacked and knocked about. We do know that he had to change one or two. Um, he was censored once with uh, a play which was about, mentioned Falstaff. Falstaff is Shakespeare's second choice. He first called him Old Castle. We know this, it's in one or two of the extant plays, and he was criticised. Old Castle was a very uh, um, a Protestant martyr, and his descendant, his great grandson, was Lord Cobham, and he wouldn't allow Old Castle to be pilloried on the stage to be, to be a clown. So Shakespeare had to change it, and we got several plays with Old Castle in it, and we got several, well, the finished thing is Falstaff, so we know he had to change the play, otherwise it would never have been put on. So he changed it. We know that he did this, uh, he was a jobbing playwright in that sense. If you add that into the fact that he never actually took any of pains to publish his stuff, he saw it as a working venture, that these things would be hacked about, used, adapted, just as they are today. So to his attitude to them doesn't seem to be in any way precious shall we say. Although scholars would say they are so deeply written, you do have to study them to be able to understand all the things he's getting at. Okay? So this is to set his context of, of where he is. What we have here is a tiered society as well. We would literally have the Aristos Arist here. We would have the merchants here. And we would have the Gorblimes down here. They would literally be everybody there. And if you look at the plays, all of the plays have three levels of action in it. There's usually a romance, there's usually a legal argument, something about government and, and, and organization of the people, and also there's some belly laughs. A lot of it is quite rude stuff in Shakespeare. We don't know it's rude now because the slang has been lost, but a lot of it is. He created several ca characters. Not only do we have Bottom, but we have a chap called Pompey Bum. We have all sorts of names that you would expect from Carry On films. And they're uh, enmeshed into the story. When he writes Sir Henry V, which is considered to be one of the sort of greatest poems to leadership in the language, he also puts four of his characters who are real villains, thieves. They're swearing on stage. One of them has to be hanged because of the way he behaves when, he, when they're in France. So the play it weaves the whole story from the foot soldiers right through to the king himself. And Shakespeare's reflecting all of those as he portrays the, the story. 
remember, he's knocking out about, it's about two and a quarter a year of these plays, all of which are still being performed now. So we can say that he is the greatest storyteller in that sense that the world has seen until, up until now. Right. One of the things which I'm going to just move on to a little bit is we've talked a little bit about literally this, this playhouse of, of which he was a part and parcel to its formula, formation actually, and the way the structure of it, although lots of other people um, partook of this. We can also say something about his characters. I've mentioned Falstaff. Now this is to do with the way he wrote. I'm going to put Falstaff up here in one of his forms. This is from the opera. Shakespeare was able to write characters that moved out of the plays into other areas. It is said, and again it's could be apocryphal, it is said that Queen Elizabeth so loved Falstaff in the plays Henry IV, well, parts one and two, that she actually asked Shakespeare to write a play with Falstaff in it, but a comedy, one where he's in love. Um, so great was this. Here we have the, this is a reference to the opera. This character is said alongside this one here, Hamlet, to be so alive that Professor Bloom of the University of New York, Yale, and Harvard, he's a professor at all three, as you can see, he considers that Shakespeare created what we have the concept literally, of what it is to be human. As you can see, he doesn't get there quickly, but his theory is based on the fact that what we see and what we feel when we see Hamlet and Falstaff particularly on stage, but I would include one or two of the letters, is what it's like to be a human being thinking. We all know about the soliloquies, the famous sort of speeches um, on stage, Bloom reckons that Shakespeare is able, by the way he structures language, to make us feel that the characters we're seeing have a life far beyond the stage that we see them on. So much so that Queen Elizabeth could ask to see Falstaff in a different play, in a different situation. Now we're, we're fairly used to that now with things like Sherlock Holmes and stuff. And, you know, characters who come alive and then get transferred into other films and you know, Rocky One, Rocky Two, Rocky Three. <laughs> but the the literally the the way to manipulate language to cre create a character that seems to be thinking on stage, I would say, still has never been surpassed. Hamlet. I mean, that's Hamlet being played by a woman, Sarah Bernhardt, on the stage. Somebody like that is such a powerful description of a human being that they seem more real uh, often than the person you went to the theatre with, sitting next to you. They are just so alive. Um, and that is considered to be his achievement. Um, so, characterization we've talked about and the theatre itself. Let's see. Yeah, I think it's about time we, uh, we spread a little bit into seeing what he does. So I'm going to give out some song sheets to you. So um, if you can't read, if you need lights or something like that, please say. If you pass these around, there should be, I think it's four. They're double sided, so you should get four pages. Two pages. Two pages, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah, well, four pages on, on two double sides. You've got, I mean.
It's called Shakespeare, by the way, because it was originally going to be called Why Shakespeare? But then I couldn't, I realized I didn't properly answer the question that I'd asked because I wanted to extol his virtues really rather than criticize him in any shape or form. Um, one thing, uh, while I'm at this, I think I'll, yeah, just to sh carry over the thing which I mentioned before. You might not realize that not only did Shakespeare not actually publish any of his stuff, it wasn't gathered together until a good 16 or so years after his death. So his plays were being literally lying around in theatres, pinched by other people, other publishers, pinched by other playwrights, pinched by actors. Actors would go and watch the plays, not just his, but other playwrights at all, memorise the story, come back, write their own versions of it, so that there are several versions of The Merchants of Venice, several Hamlets and things, several Princes of Denmark and things, which we which we got extant. There were no laws of, of um, copyright in those days, so it wasn't illegal to pinch these things. You had to sue people in open court and prove that they'd nicked it. So when these plays were gathered together by two of his friends, this is what they had to write at the as, as a front piece. This is John Hemmings and Henry Henry Condell. It's worth saying that we don't know what Shakespeare looked like, but they were fellows who knew him, drank with him, were good friends, they were involved with him in terms of the construction of the theatre. <clears throat> Unfortunately, you've got a rotten picture there on the front. It hasn't come out very well when we took it to the photocopies. This is what they reckon he looked like. That's, this is drawn by an artist who never saw him from their description. And they said that that is what he looked like. There are people who knew him, and they said that that was, is what Shakespeare. There are three other portraits which are, we don't think uh, are, are taken from life, and they haven't actually been endorsed by people who knew him. So this is more likely to be what he looked like. Okay? And this is what they wrote on the beginning of the thing. It had been a thing, we confess, worthy to have been wished that the author himself had lived to set forth and overseen his own writings. But since it hath been ordained otherwise, and he by death departed from that right, we pray you do not envy his friends the office of their care and pain to have collected and published them, and so to have published them as were before you were abused with diverse stolen, surreptitious copies, maimed and deformed, by frauds and stealths of injurious impostors that expose them. Even those are now offered to your view, cured and perfect of their limbs, and all the rest, absolute in their numbers, just as he conceived them. Okay? So that was, it was so rife in literally the way they'd been pinched and stolen and hacked about, that they had to put that at the beginning. And that's the first folio, gathered together by his friends. Right. Um, it wasn't complete, there were still two plays missed out. But, so we know from that that his attitude to his own work was rather cavalier. You know, he, as I said, he didn't seem to treasure it or to, to value it beyond literally getting them out and getting them seen by the public. Okay. So. He writes incredible characters, which are still sort of uh, copied and expounded and analysed and uh, tackled by people that are still writing plays today and writing stories. He creates very good stories, so that you have Macbeth is stolen by for the Japanese to, to present a, a warlord uh, from him. Um, King Lear is, is pinched by... Uh, American playwrights and set in I Iowa o over a farm. Um, Romeo and Juliet is stolen um, and turned into a gang um, battle in New York. Um, so you're getting his stories constantly being lifted, rearranged and fed back to us. So his stories are lively too. But it's probably as a poet that he's actually considered to be, or a wordsmith I'm going to say, rather than just a poet. 
to be really profound. Well, what I want to do with you now is if you would just have a look at Sonnet 18. Let me frame this. The sonnets were written throughout his life. We don't exactly know when he started or when he finished. These were published by other people, not by him, but we do think that he got several amounts of cash for them. Poems were circulated amongst the gentry, and they would read them, and they would um, compare them, they would often write their own. Um, the nature of poetry was constantly being argued over, and a good poet could make a lot of money just by reading his stuff. They were, the, if you like, the pop culture of the day. They were literally uh, what people did of an evening in the, in the great houses of, of London, and certainly in the universities. One of the things that was that, that criticised Shakespeare and, and meant that he wasn't taken seriously was he had never been to university. He was a grammar school boy. He'd never been to university. So he was criticised in his lifetime as being an upstart, someone who, with no education. Right. What you've got there is a sonnet. And just let me, I want to mention just a little bit about the sonnet form. Um, it's written, it has a very strict rhyming scheme, and the rhyming scheme is down the right-hand side. So A's rhyme with A's, B's with B's, then C's with C's, D's with D's, E's with E's, F's with F's, and then there's two G's, which is a rhyming couplet at the bottom. I've separated it out for you because not many people notice that there are three four-line quatrains. I'm using the posh language here so that you can get involved in this. Three four-line quatrains, and then a couplet a double line, and that is a very strict form. Often it's written down with an eight and a six or two sevens, but that is the way the rhyming scheme is meant to be built. The first four lines are meant literally as an exposition to lay the ground of what we're going to talk about. Okay? So that has to hold together and lead us in to a subject. The second four then are to complicate that or extend it to take out the ramifications. What, what is implied in the first bit must then be expanded. Then the third one must include, include a twist or a contradiction, a but if you like, a bit of difference. And then the couplet at the end should conclude, bring it all together and complete it. Okay. So you've got to have that rhyming scheme, you've got to have the quatrains and the, and the couplet, and it's got to be something that you're expounding. Yeah? Okay. Right. Group participation, that means yes, and that means no. It's a lot to take in, isn't it? Because when you look at the poem, you, you don't realise that it's actually structured, that, that there's, sca there's scaffolding underneath this, unless you've done it before. So part of the, the genius of this is that Shakespeare makes it look easy. I'm going to read it in a minute, and you don't notice the rhymes. They're there. Rhyme, if you try and describe what rhyming does, or alliteration, what a poet is doing, what a wordsmith is doing, is making the words memorable to you. Gluing them into your brain. Now, we did, we're used to this now with advertising jingles and things like that. People use rhyme and alliteration because it burns, somehow, words and ideas into our brains. So what Shakespeare is doing here is so that you don't notice it. He's playing with the words, and he's giving you the rhymes, so it tends to stick. And it gives you a song-like quality. <coughs> There's a music to it. We'll talk about that in a moment. I'm just going to, I'm going to read it first of all in just a plain and simple way. If you, if you can just follow it with your eyes, you might notice the scheme of the words, or if you want to, just listen and just notice how natural the rhymes seem. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaf hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and oft is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fur from fur sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fur thou owest, nor shall death brag thy wanderest in his shade, 
when in eternal lines the time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Okay? Can you hear the music? Yeah? Yeah? No? <laughs> okay. Why it's important is because when you're doing close reading like that, you have to break it down and see how he's manipulating us and how he's pulling us and, and making us feel. But at the end of the day, you've got to put it back together and feel the whole thing. Because if it's done properly, you will hear it like music. You won't hear it like a rhyme. It's a bad point when you notice the rhyme structure or when you, know, you can feel that the, that word doesn't fit. Now, it's rare that you get that with Shakespeare. This sonnet form is probably the most difficult, I would say, in English, in English writing. The haiku is supposed to be the most difficult, which is a Japanese structure. But this one, I always think, is equally as tough um, because it, it has to do so many things. Now he's also, part of his format, he's writing in a thing which is called iambic pentameter. And what that means is that there is a beat to this, to this poem. The beat is what keeps you moving. And the poets of the 20th century often say, um, people, people like Frost and Eliot would say, the beat is absolutely important to, to poetry be, be, and to meaning. Because... The, uh, the, I think Robert Frost is the one that said, if you can hear somebody in the, in the next, door, next room, and you can hear them talking, but you can't hear the words, okay? So we're in here. Say there's someone in the next door, and then you can hear them talking, but you can't hear the words. You can feel the meaning that they're about. You can tell what they're talking about. You can tell if they're putting forward a proposition, whether they're arguing, whether they're discussing, and the nature of their conversation, yes? Yeah. That's the beat. Now the beat that Shakespeare's using is a classical one. It's, it, it's called iambic, that means it's based, it, it has a foot which has got one beat and, and, and uh, one stressed syllable, one unstressed. He's talking about syllables, so he'll change the spelling to change the way the syllables are in a word to get that beat going or to break it. The beat he wants is bump, bump, so there's a, it's bump, 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 five, pent, pentatonic, okay? So he's got five beats in his lines. Bump, 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 shall I compare the two a summer's day? What? When he misses one out, yeah, it, it makes you trip. There's a slight trip. The beat goes with it and you feel it. When he's doing that, he's going to manipulate that. Once he's got that beat for you, and you can clap the rhythm like you can when you learn music, it's, it's, the, it's the space uh, beat, space beat. When he plays with that, he's going to make, literally, you miss that beat and you run things together. And it gives you a certain sense of disturbance. In his plays, he writes his plays often in iambic pentameter, and when he has disturbance coming, like another character is about to come in, he will start to break the beat on the, the last three or four lines so that you know something challenging is going to happen. Okay? Right. So, all this is going on, and he wrote 154 of them. And they're all very good. Not as magic as some of the ones here. There's some ordinary ones, but not many. And to follow that form through, right the way through, is really quite difficult. Okay? Now, if, if we just look at what he's getting at here. So we've got the first, the actual exposition. So like, he's comparing someone to a summer's day. There's a lot of conjecture. We're sort of settled now that some of the poems are written to a beautiful young man, and some are written to a dark lady, and a lot of people say that there are others which are written to something else. Um, you pay your money and you take your choice, whether he was gay, whether he was both, whether he was madly in love, whatever. 
doesn't seem to matter to me. What matters is literally he's talking about the divinity in terms of a human being. Shall I convert thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling, but, but may. So what this, the word more temperate there, he's saying actually you're more constant than a summer's day. If I compared you to a summer's day, which is a, a beautiful, wonderful thing, I actually have to say, well, no, you're more temperate. You're more constant and more even than a summer's day. Rough winds do shake of the loved buds of May, and summer's lease has all too short a day. He's introducing here the idea of, rent, of literally rental. You know, summer's lease is all too short a day. So there's time here. There's restriction of time in terms of summer. Summer flies, as we're at this time of year, we can feel it moving. We notice that the lights are drawing in. The time literally only comes to perfection for a short period of time and then starts to lose it. Okay? And that losing of it is going to come back again here. Time is going to be a very important aspect of this and a lot of the other sides. How do we manage to capture something which is beautiful and preserve it from the ravages of time? Sometime too hot, the eye of heaven shines. Now, this interesting thing about the eye, it brings in the concept of a, of a watcher. This whole eye of heaven, which is a very, very old image. I mean, it goes right back to ancient Egypt, of the actual sun as a, as a watching eye. Sometime too hot, the eye of heaven shines, and oft is his gold complexion dim. Notice that he's, he's actually personalizing the sun. It's, it's, not only is it got an eye, but it's a, it's a man, it's a he. And every fur from fur sometime declines. Beauty is lost. Even the most, the greatest thing in the universe, the, the sun, seems to, 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 to fail as winter comes. And human beings, by chance or nature's changing course, untrimmed. So we are actually shortened as well in our span and in our beauty and our whatever. By chance, you know, you can lose a leg, you can get eaten by a tiger, you can get hit by a bus. Or you can actually live out your full length of years, but you're still going to lose what quality, what beauty you have. Time takes it from us. So we've had the exposition, and then we've complicated it a little bit and extended it a bit. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fur thou owest that thou owns, nor shall death drag thou once that wander in his shade. This is the old concept of, of, uh, that the Greeks had, that when you died, unless you were of a particular intense character, that you were able to sustain yourself after death, then you wandered like a shade in Hades. You were literally like a ghost. Um, sort of you, it, nothing but misery and sort of shame and whatever accrued to you. So this Greek idea is being uh, classically mentioned here, that is, that death bragged thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So he's putting forward this idea that there is a way to be preserved. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, this poem, and this gives life to thee. Now, when you read that, I'm not giving you what the, pay, or what the poem means, I'm giving you the sort of general consensus of what people have hacked out of that. That poem is a, is a mystery. It's not a complete mystery, but there are mysterious things in it as to what he's saying and who he's saying it about. When people tell you that it's about a boy uh, or about a woman, make your own mind up. You know, It could be about, uh, you know, we'll talk a bit later on, that the, that Shakespeare seems to be have been influenced by philosophical ideas which were around at the time. And a lot of these poems seem to be feeding into literally what he's thinking of at any given moment. Okay. <clears throat> so you've got that rhyming scheme, you've got the beat and the rhythm concealed in it. Uh, hopefully it doesn't smack you in the eyes so that you get the feeling that this man has manipulated he's chosen his words so well that the meaning comes across without the use of the glue of, of rhyme and alliteration to, to stick it you know when you look at you notice these things when you see that in the one two three four five six seven eight line down you've got chance and changing course on trim those that's alliterative and it helps to make that line 
a little bit more memorable, easier to remember. Important because these things were often said and memorized, and particularly important in speeches, but also in fixing it for us so that we do feel that the nature of this poem uh, is intense enough to stay in our mind's eye. <coughs> is that, does everybody follow that, what I've been saying about that? Okay. Right. So, <clears throat> in being able to do that, no one has quite, I would say, uh, and there's, there's quite a bit of sort of groundswell of opinion that he is the greatest poet that has ever been in English. Um, probably he's more quoted than, well, he's certainly more quoted than anybody else, but uh, the number of times his lines are, you've seen, you can see in that one, The Darling Buds of May. We, people just take titles from his words because his words just seem to stay together. He seems to encapsulate forms. A little bit more about that later, but if you can notice that, um, it's a very witty thing to say about him that Shakespeare only wrote in quotations. And it does seem more and more that that is what he was doing. Right. Anybody with any questions about anything so far? Darling seems a very modern word. It does. <coughs> Well, it's, it's from dealing, isn't it? Is it? Oh, yeah, yes. Um, so it just means somebody who's very dear. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yes. probably comes, you know, as a direct yes. translation of Sherry from the French. But, um. Okay. So um, the, the illustration there is the front piece from this from this is this stolen, which is his <coughs> friends published when they published his works after his death, and. His great friend, a fellow called Ben Johnson, who was probably the second greatest playwright of the age, of the age. and it was an age of playwrights. I mean, we still uh, put <coughs> on plays from that period in, on in the English theatre quite regularly. But there were several um, playwrights who really were world class. Um, ben Johnson was his great friend, who uh, they they had. A lot of rivalry between them. But he actually said the, the beauty of Shakespeare was that he was for all time. Even, you know, a contemporary of his, one of his friends, someone who drank with him regularly, was able to say that about him and his work. He also said he was good fun to be with, by the way, so it's, uh, it's worth having that sort of accolade, I think. People say that Shakespeare must have been an aristocrat, or it must have been because uh, how could just a common man have written like this? Somebody who was brought up literally. His father was a glover. Um, he got married at 18, which was meant he was a minor at that time. He, 21 was the age of consent. So his parents would have actually had to sign the forms he got married. He got married to a lady that was 26. And she gave birth within six months of their marriage. So it looks like he was rush, shall we say. Um, he had three kids. Within The whole bloodline was didn't survive beyond his, his daughters. So there are no um, lineage holders in Shakespeare's family. They fizzled out within about 60 years of him. He lived until he was 52. Um, and he seemed to have been hailing hearty to within a couple of months of his death. Uh, we know they travelled to London, etc. Um, in his will, he left no nothing for any aristocrat or landed gentry, other than his friends and family. He left most of these things to his daughter. In those days, if he had been a friend of aristocrats and lords and ladies, he would have left some sort of keepsake to them. It was what was done. Um, so, it wasn't part of his, uh, part of what's believed it was that they, uh, uh, that his big ambition was to restore the family fortunes to the, you know, to the gentry. You know, that there had been some kind of generational proof of high status throughout his father. Yeah. Is that credible? It's, 
based on the fact that his father was an old man uh, in, in Stratford and seemed to fall from grace. The general scholarly reason for that is that this was the time when Catholicism was being outlawed. It had been outlawed in that you couldn't practice Catholicism in, in, the, in the country. And it's said that in London people were being executed for doing the Latin Mass, etc. But in the countryside, it's generally thought that the people didn't really give two hoots as to what it was, and people were not being criticised, but it was hard for someone who professed or actually still practised Catholicism to hold an office. There's lots of suggestions that Shakespeare was, if not a Catholic, then a Catholic sympathiser. But then a lot of people were, don't forget, sort of, 50 years earlier, everybody had been Catholic. <laughs> so, I mean, and suddenly, you know, Henry VIII says, no, no, it's, it's not allowed anymore, and I'm going to be the head of the... So a lot of people had rankles about it. And people in the countryside of Park didn't take it all that seriously. As long as there was somewhere to go and get married and, you know, do the Bible study, they didn't really take much notice as to what it was. But, so, what is it is actually said? We don't know what happened to his father. We know that he was a glover and he was in trade and he actually became an alderman. And then towards the end of his life, he had several debts which he couldn't meet. Um, and Shakespeare did buy some places in London which were known to be um, associated with Catholic sympathizers. But apart from that, we don't know. As I say, he never left the letters. He did. This is all conjecture which you can make of it. There's a strong conjecture that he came up here to Lord Derby's estate and taught his children. Because there's a, if this is based on literally one name appearing in a register in the, um, in the payment of the Lord Derby to a man called Shakespeare. It's only mentioned once, and on that they build the whole thing. Well, he was, he was good at Latin. He was, could have come up here and taught children Latin. He'd been sort of a Catholic tutor. It's possible. But there's no real evidence of that. I always like mentioning this as well. He seems to have spelled his name 16 different ways. <laughs> and doesn't seem to have bothered about spelling. But then nobody did. Until you had printers, it didn't matter how you spelled your name, you know, because you were usually in immediate discourse. You have to remember that written language is a very poor copy of speech. And to hammer out how to get speech captured in a written form is really difficult. And they were still having quite good at form. Punctuation was still being generated, you know, it was, they were looking for things to capture the important inflections that we get into speech, and they didn't manage it, you know. Um, we're only talking about this today, we're very lucky nowadays that we can take recordings of people, so we have great artists and people recorded as they spoke and stuff, so, um, but up until then you had to try and capture it in some form, music was tried to be captured on dots and stuff, and it's not as magic as the as the actual thing. So again, this is another form. Printing was just coming in, the whole idea of this. Lots of people didn't take printing seriously. You know, um, Shakespeare wrote with a pen. Uh, we know this because Johnson said he didn't blot his lines. He didn't cross lines out. So he seemed to write inspired. Um, but this is one man talking about another man. You know? um, so we're not, other than that, there's no evidence of that. We haven't got any of his foul papers. You know, the foul papers were handwritten sheets that they then printed from to produce the plays. Um, so, we haven't got any of those. We've got literally, in terms of his handwriting, we've got, I think it's five examples of his signature, which is not much. Really. <laughs> and a lot of stuff came out long after he was dead, you know, so it's... Um, People sort of say, well, do you think he wrote the plays, or do you think that Francis Bacon wrote the plays? And I think the best answer is a historical one. When King James came to the throne in 1603, he gave, um, Shakespeare's group of men were called the uh, Chancellor's men, and um, they had been the, the Lord of Pembroke's men. He gave them a charter and called them the King's men. From that time on, the, the group of players was called the King's men. He also had a procession through London to the streets when he was crowned, um, and he gave Shakespeare. We've still got the bills. Has anybody here got a degree by any chance from a university? Just put your hands up. Did you go and get the, the gown? 
Yes. You yeah, did. You hired a gown. Yeah. Did you hire it from a company? Yeah. Eden Ravenscroft, by any chance? Uh, opposite yeah. Liverpool Uni. Yeah. Well, Eden Ravenscroft are the ones that still hire gowns to all uh, university graduates, and they built. They actually made the cloak that Shakespeare wore. This company's there, and it's still in the records that he wore. Now, King James gave him. I think it's something like about four pounds to buy the velvet, and he wouldn't have given that to somebody who didn't like the place. If it was Francis Bacon, he wouldn't have got involved in all that tripe. He just said, Bacon, you march it. He <laughs> wouldn't have messed about. So certainly, for the first 200 years, nobody even doubted that Shakespeare wrote the place. And all these conspiracies grew up long after that. Most of them seem to be based on the fact that this man, who didn't go to university and left school probably at 14, wrote some of the greatest things in the English language, and a lot of people can't accept that. He seems to have been fairly fluent in French, and a little bit of Italian. His, uh, he seems to have understood Latin, but a lot of the, the, the things he cribbed, a bit later on we'll be mentioning the fact that he does pinch lines wholeheartedly from people. He pinches a lot of Ovid, um, Latin scholar, but he pinches, he, he could have pinched them in English translation. Scholars can do this, they can look through the thing and say, well actually, he's not using what Ovid's using, he's using what Golding translated Ovid as, and it's not quite right. So we know that Shakespeare's pinched the English rather than pinched the actual original Latin. But he did pinch whole lines and put them in his plays. Okay, I want to move on to the second one now. How would you have time? It's 25 minutes. Well, yeah, I haven't got quite the way through this yet, so I'm going to have to... <coughs> I want to tackle this next one just to show you that the sonic thing is not a flu. Um, he's going to do it again. And um, again, the meaning at this time will be different. He's bringing out a different aspect of, of, of the feeling life and he's actually capturing it using exactly the same limitations but with a different tone. Would anybody else like to read this? You must be getting fed up with my voice. No? Oh, the girl, but I've never read it before. So. Okay, Ron, that's good. <coughs> Off you go. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone betweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy contented like least. Yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, haply I think on thee and then my state. Like to the lark at break of day arising, from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Good, well read. And you fell into his trap, by the way. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> he's put a word in there that he's made up. Now, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, I did wonder, as I was coming up yeah. to that, I wondered. There's a guy at Liverpool University called Davis, who, um, one of the professors there, and um, Bill Davis, he's just brought out a book with a neuroscientist at Liverpool, saying that one of the wonderful things that Shakespeare does is he uses words out of context. He'll turn a noun into a verb, and he'll turn a verb into a noun. Now what he's doing here, he's be weep. He's turning weep into a different type of word. He's changing the whole context of it. And what that does to us is it makes us read the line twice, because we can't understand it first time, because it's not a real word. Now when he does this to us, he's coining words, but what the neuroscientist says is, you have to rethink everything, or the whole meaning. So your brain runs back, heightened awareness. You become more uh, intense at that section. And you're still bouncing off this word be weak when you're into the next line and the next line. So it makes you intensify your focus, right? 
Now, he didn't know this about neuroscience, he just he was playing about. He's having fun with this. When you realize that he's got the form now, he's playing with it, he's, give, he's doing what a poet must do, he's got a romantic description here of feeling states, so he's engaging us with literally the content of, of the human soul, but he's also playing purely with language. So the people like Borden and Joyce would just say, what he's playing with here is really little tricks. And he notices that he uses the word state three times. There's three different states. It's the same word, but it has a different, slightly different meaning in each one. There's two heavens. Heaven on one side is actually, you know, deaf. It's not listening. It's not letting him in. And the next one, he's at heaven's gate. So the whole poem has is, 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 is got tension between those two uses of the word. But state is the, you know, the first one, and then the second one, and he actually uses it as a, as, a, as a false rhyme. He actually doubles up the rhyming in that. So again, he's mucking about with the form within the form. He hasn't changed it dramatically, but he's pulled it about enough to make the poets who are analyzing this think, wow, um, this fellow's got quite a range of vocabulary. Can you see that? Okay. And if you go through the meaning of it, he's also doing one of those things where he breaks the rhythm. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my brutalist cry. You've got three beats on the, on the thing there. Trouble deaf heaven, you've got to say that quickly. There's no, there's no upbeat on it. It's all heavy stress. Trouble deaf heaven with my bootless, my useless. In the olden days, if you went to somebody in supplication, if you owed them money and you couldn't pay, you went with your shoes off. This was the thing right back to Roman times, you know, you, you took your shoes off and you went barefooted to them and you hung your head down. Little tear helped as well, but you, that, that bootless is, to go there bootless means, you know, you're completely defenseless, you're useless. Uh, with my useless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed. So he's coming through those quatrains again. He's, he's, he's actually given us the problem. Now he's extending it. He's, you know, he's making it a little bit more complicated, desiring this man's art and that man's scope. And with what I most enjoy, contented least, in other words, the things he can do, he, they just don't work for him anymore. Yet in these thoughts myself most despising, happily I think on thee. Suddenly it changes. And all those things, the deaf heaven, the state he was in suddenly changes. Happily, I think, on thee. And then my state, <coughs> like to the, that's the but. That's where it comes up and twisted here now. I've given you all that. Oh, poor miserable me. But then, happily, I think, on thee. And then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising, from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings that when I scorn, to change my that then I start to change my state with kings. Again, you don't notice the rhyme. The rhythm slides past you. You just hear it as a music, which lulls you into the meaning of the poem. Yes. Mm -hmm. One hundred and fifty-four of them. Okay. You just have, you think you just have to every now and then. Yeah. And two plays every year, or two and a quarter plays every year, you know. Um, and he used to write coats of arms. He did several coats of arms for, for aristocrats as well. He didn't paint them, but he did write them. His friend used to paint them. Right. Did you, do you think? Because I just want to go and do some of the degree speech, and then we should be... Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. We're going to have a break in a, in a few moments, for those of you whose bums are revolting. I don't mean that in a descriptive sense. But, uh. Right. So what I want to do now is just to, 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 to take from that and say, probably you will come across Shakespeare in terms of the plays. And most of the plays have signature speeches in them. Speeches from which the, the plot seems to hang or seems to swing and spin. And the nature of, of what he's actually able to do in that, 
Now, this, in the second half of the talk, I'm hoping to go on a little bit more as to what sort of philosophy he could be expounding. But a very important part of, uh, of that aspect is that the philosophy of Shakespeare is really quite profound in that when he writes a play, he doesn't give it goodies and baddies. When you read it on the page, he's not saying this is the goodie, this is the baddie. What he's actually giving all the time is reasons for everybody. So everybody is re has a reasonable situation. You understand where they're coming from and why they're acting the way they do. And it's very, very easy to play one up, and actors do this all the time, to build their part up and to become more powerful in the situation. And for directors to rejig it, to maybe live out a little bit of, of the tone of one thing and change it so that um, Iago can steal the whole uh, play of Othello. So much so that when um, Frank Finley and Laurence Olivia did Othello, Othe um, Olivia insisted that they swap over every night. So that Monday night, Laurence Olivia was Othello. Tuesday night, he was Iago. He wasn't going to let any Iago steal the best lines out of the play. Which meant he had to learn both parts. And when you realize that both parts are enormous, the man has given himself a hell of a lot more work just so as not to be upstaged by this creep who's almost as good as him. So the plays are fantastic in that sense. You know, they don't have a prescription. You can you quote somebody in this part here. We're just going to have Ulysses. Uh, the, Ulysses is going to talk here. The men are camped outside Troy. This is the, uh, the Trojan War. They've gone off. They're chasing after uh, um, trying to get uh, Helen of Troy back. She's quite a classical character. She appears a few times in, in, in Shakespeare. The men have been, I think they've been at war for about eight years, uh, camped outside Troy. They didn't fight the way we did. What happened is bunches of the Greeks would engage with the Trojans. They'd come out, they'd have a bit of a skirmish, and then they'd go back in. And they would fight through heroes so that um, Hector inside would come out and fight with Achilles or Ajax, etc. Um, so this uh, war would be quite protracted, and it, there would be quite a business, and a lot of money would be involved in all this, feeding the troops and keeping them at, at bay and stuff. And the Greek lands are getting a bit fed up. They're saying to, uh, to Agamemnon, look, we want to go home, you know, it's lambing time, it's, I haven't seen the missus for four or five years, and the kids now have all left home, etc. So they're complaining. And Agamemnon gives a speech just before Ulysses, and he says, well, actually, if we're not here fighting, what, um, there's no way we can structure ourselves. There's no way we can organize our society as to who are the best and who aren't, unless we test ourselves in competition. We've got to do something which makes separates the men from the boys, in other words. And this is why we're here. We're not actually here just to fight the Trojans and to capture, bring Helen back. We're here because of, it gives us a purpose, and that purpose gives us a structure, a hierarchy to our society. His speech is not as powerful as Ulysses. Ulysses then stands up and he comes out with this thing which is, the speech is often used because Shakespeare is writing here about a thing called harmony. The very fact that structure in anything can be so tuned that it resounds, it becomes something else. It becomes perfect. Okay. And that societies can become perfect as well. Now this concept is, is, a, is a very ancient one. Uh, it's a classical one. That societies themselves have to be organized. And that they have to have hierarchies. And hierarchies are to do with functions. Your function and your priority given by that particular function structures the whole society. And when it gets out of kilter, and um, Shakespeare didn't know there were rights the week he, he, um, this is, he was writing about concepts which are very ancient but totally to do with society structure but what I was going to, what I'm going to say is as I read this to you now notice he does it with imagery I've given it to you in a very raw state and it sounds dull and uninteresting 
he's going to give it to you with images. And the images will resound inside your head and give it a lot more meaning. Okay? Does anybody else want to do this? Again. Sorry, I keep grabbing them because I... There's one or two subtle lines in this. It actually just feels great in your mouth when you say them. They're just amazing. Anybody want to have a go? Okay. <clears throat> so Ulysses steps up and he says he starts to talk to them about why degree is important. The heavens themselves, the planets, and this center observe degree, priority, and place. In sister, course, proportion, season, and form, office and custom, in all line of order, and therefore is the glorious planet Sol, the sun, sorry, in noble eminence, enthroned and sphere amidst the other, whose medicinable eye directs the ill aspects of planet evil, and posts like the commandment of a king, sans check to good and bad. So we say he's comparing the sun to the commandments of a king. The sun commands all the earth, all the weather, and all the systems beneath it, like a king commands with his order, without check to good and bad. But when the planets, in evil mixture to disorder, wander, what plagues and what portents, what mutinies, what raging of the sea, shaking of earth, commotion in the winds, frights, Changes, horrors, divert and crack, rend and deracinate the unity and married calm of states, quite from their fixture. Oh, when degree is shaken, which is the ladder to all high designs, the enterprise is sick. How could committees, degrees in schools and brotherhoods in cities, peaceful commerce from dividable shores, the primogenitive and due of birth, prerogative of age, Crowns, scepters, laurels, but by degree stand in authentic place. Take but degree away, untune that string, and hark what discord follows. Each thing meets in mere repugnancy. The bounded waters would lift their bosoms higher than the shores, and make a sop of all this solid globe. Strength would be the lord of imbecility, and the rude son would strike his father dead. Force would be right, or right, or rather right and wrong, between whose endless jar justice resides, would lose their names, and so would justice too. Then everything includes itself in power, power into will, will into appetite, and appetite, a universal wolf, so doubly seconded with will and power, must make perforce an universal prey, and last, eat up himself. It's the way he says it, isn't it, really? <laughs> <laughs> now we can break that up, and you can see that what he's done is he's actually taken the universal concept, the, the sun in heaven, and then he's extended it down into the situation of a, of a society. But not just starting from, from the king, but bringing it right the way down, to literally to the homes, to the schools, literally to um, commerce between one country and another. I, I did, when, I, when I first sort of looked at this um, some years ago, I was reminded of a very, very similar speech, and it is very, very similar. And it's from Thomas Hobbes Leviathan, and it's written about 30 years after Shakespeare wrote that. Um, I've got the full quote if anybody wants it. It's, um, it, it's very parallel to what Shakespeare has put there, but <laughs> Hobbes his language is a lot more sort of prosaic than Shakespeare. And he finishes up, you've probably heard this, heard this. Thomas Hobbes is considered to have paraphrased this with, without government, human life is solitary, poor, mean, nasty, brutish, and short. Okay, so that's how, how Hobbes translated the whole concept that Shakespeare's getting on there. It's about the fact that in terms of a society, it's the working together 
which in, consists purely of a hierarchical structure of functions and interfunctions, a society can hum. It can be totally harmonious. Not for long. It seems to reach that stage and then descend away from it. And Shakespeare would put that firmly in terms of the leadership. He would say it's down to the kings. It's down to the way they organize us and the way they relate to us. And he gives lots of examples throughout his plays of good ones and bad ones. You could say a lot of his plays are purely about leadership. Kingship, it's often called. But leadership is, is what he's actually getting at. And the way that a leader can structure a group, a team, a bunch of people into a tuned system that works, that hums, that really works well. Are we ready for a short break? Mm -hmm. Just before you go, there is no charge for these talks here, um, but we're part of, of, a, of a sort of a charity that is, is, is teaching the works of Eugene Halliday, etc. If you want to contribute, there's a bowl in the other room. Um, if you don't want to contribute, that's fine, but if you do want to contribute, there's a bowl there for you to just put something in. It is a charity. I don't take the money. We, we do these things just to keep our brains alive. Hasn't worked with me. <laughs> Thank you. There's one Thank more you. thing um, as regards to toilets. Uh, the toilet downstairs by the front door, there's also the one upstairs. Um, there's no lock on the one upstairs. So, what we tend to do is if it's closed, there's somebody in. If it's open, there isn't. So, if you give the toilets up there, leave the door open when you come out. Or sing. Or sing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll do it.